Welcome to the Three Martini Lunch. Grab a stool next to Greg Corumbus of Radio America and Jim Garrity of National Review. Three Martinis coming up. Hey, really glad you're with us for the Thursday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. Just three martinis today. Yesterday, of course, we had four because we got off on a detour at the end on uh, Hallmark movies and uh, some of the curious plot lines involved there. I do have one correction, Jim. I mentioned that Mrs. Corumbus, when I uh, point out that the... um, that it's pretty obvious at the beginning of a Hallmark movie, who's going to get together, that I only gave part of the quote. She says her real quote is, it's not about the destination, it's about the journey. So mm-hmm. there you go. Anyway, uh, the greatest, of course, uh, Christmas movie, Die Hard. I'm sure we'll have more to say uh, as time goes on, but uh, plenty to talk about today as well. And we're brought to you in part by Ritual Multivitamins. You want to stay healthy, and so putting the right vitamins into your body is important, but you also want to know what's in those vitamins besides the vitamins. Ritual's got a clean, vegan-friendly multivitamin. It doesn't include sugars, GMOs, major allergens, synthetic fillers, none of that garbage, but it does have a great fresh taste. It's got a delayed-release capsule designed to make taking your vitamins easy, and it's great getting on a routine of taking Ritual multivitamins. Ritual is designed with your life stage in mind. It's now available for women, men, and a teen version. And Ritual multivitamins are scientifically developed to help support these different life stages. And Ritual makes your healthy habits easy. Your multivitamins are delivered to your door every month with free shipping always. You can start, snooze, or cancel your subscription anytime. And if you don't love Ritual within your first month, they will refund your first order. So get those key nutrients without all the BS. Ritual is offering three martini lunch listeners 10% off during your first three months. Visit ritual.com slash martini to start your ritual today. Ritual.com slash martini. All right, Jim, let's move to our good martini. And we're back to the story of Peng Shui and China and her... A social media message at the beginning of uh, November publicly accusing a former high-ranking Chinese Communist Party official of raping her, saying that their relationship at certain points was consensual, but uh, she, he definitely forced himself on her at other times as well. To their great credit, the Women's Tennis Association stood up for Peng Shui, uh, saying they want proof that she's fine. They want proof that her allegations are being investigated seriously, or else they're going to threaten to take their business out of China. Well, yesterday they made good on that threat. And the timing was very curious because earlier in the day, Jim, as I'm sure you saw, the International Olympic Committee, which of course is desperate to give a good reason for keeping the Winter Games in Beijing, said, oh yeah, we just got off a phone call with Peng Shui. And it's the it's the universal uh, uh, conclusion from all of us here at the IOC that she's just fine. Well, the WTA came to a very different conclusion. They said that since Peng bravely came forward with her accusation, her message has been removed from the Internet and discussion of this serious issue has been censored in China. This is a direct statement from the WTA and Steve Simon, their head. Uh, Chinese officials have been provided the opportunity to cease this censorship, verifiably prove that Peng is free and able to speak without interference or intimidation, and investigate the allegation of sexual assault in a full, fair, and transparent manner. Unfortunately, the leadership in China has not addressed this very serious issue in any credible way. While we now know where Peng is, I have serious doubts that she is free, safe, and not subject to censorship, coercion, and intimidation. The WTA has been clear on what is needed here, and we repeat our call for a full and transparent investigation without censorship into Peng Shui's sexual assault allegation. Uh, He says none of this uh, activity from China is acceptable, and he says as a result, and with the full support of the WTA Board of Directors, I am announcing the immediate suspension of all WTA tournaments in China, including Hong Kong. In good conscience, I don't see how I can ask our athletes to compete there when Peng Shui is not allowed to communicate freely and has seemingly been pressured to contradict her allegation of sexual assault. So, Jim, as we've said before, when they threaten to do this, You know, they've got a lot more courage than certainly the NBA, the Biden administration, the United Nations, the World Health Organization, all these people that have had a very legitimate opportunity uh, to hold China to account and refuse to do so. So good on the WTA. It's going to hit them in the pocketbook. Hopefully they can reschedule these tournaments for somewhere else and make some of that back. But uh, this is what political courage looks like. Indeed, Greg. And I think there's a couple of really big ramifications of this, not just the fact that the World Tennis Association is giving up effectively a billion dollars in revenue 
and really demonstrating, I think, arguably the biggest and boldest and bravest stance in opposition to, to injustice that we have seen uh, from any major institution, not just in sports. I think you can extend that to corporate America or something like, like they really are saying, no, no, these are our values and we are not willing to compromise on them, not even for a billion dollars in revenue. Um, and the, I think this does ratchet up the pressure on uh, other institutions. The, the 2022 Olympics are going to go ahead and the genocide games will, you know, will go ahead. I do think it makes it tougher for everyone involved, the corporate sponsors, NBC, everybody else, to just kind of, you know, avert their eyes and act like these are normal Olympic Games. This is not something that is roughly morally equivalent to holding the 1936 Games in Nazi Germany. Um, I think this ratchets up the pressure on institutions like the NBA. As long as nobody had done this, as long as nobody had said, nope, this is too... This is too much. We can, you know, this this is nothing. No amount of money we can make from China is worth this. Then the NBA and every other major, you know, Comcast and Disney and every other giant organiz American organization that works with China could say, "Look, nobody else is doing this. Why should we?" Well, now the WTA is doing this, so now they really can ask. Well, if, if the WTA is willing to take that financial hit, if they're willing to stand on the basic principle that vice premiers should not rape tennis stars. That's really not an exceptionally high bar. They're not even getting into the genocide. They're not even getting into the threat, military threats against Taiwan. They're not even getting into Hong Kong. That's how low the bar had come. And even a whole bunch of, you know, the Ray Dalios of the world are like, no, no, I can't, I can't, I'm not going to get into, you know, make any stance on that. Um, it makes it possible for other institutions to do this. And it makes it, it strengthens the hand for those of us who do want to see a decoupling from China and unraveling of these economic ties and a, uh, this effort to treat China as it is and stop lying to ourselves and stop lying to the world and stop averting our eyes. Look, this all strengthens our hand. We, we, it is now no longer crazy to think that a big institution could say, nope, sorry, Beijing, this is too much. We can't, we can't work with you anymore. Um, I don't know if this will necessarily help Peng Shui. I, I wonder if whatever threat she is under will be exacerbated by the higher ramifications of this. But nonetheless, um, it is a it is kind of uh, you figure Beijing must feel shocked because their old playbook of a combination of threats and bribery worked in every other case, and in this case, it is not. It's kind of striking. Um, and hopefully this is kind of the, the beginning of a cascade, a snowball that gets larger and larger. We will see how things shake out, but um, a, a, you, know, you, you really have to hand it to Simon and the WTA. And what he also said it was a unanimous decision of their board, which is reassuring, uh, because my, my fear was that at some point there'd be some people in WTA be like, well, maybe we want some of that money from China. So <laughs> we'll see how things shake out. Yeah, historically there have been some pretty prominent uh, tournaments, especially in Shanghai, in China. So it's not uh, it's not just a drop in the bucket that the WTA is giving up here. But again, hopefully they can um, figure out uh, alternatives to, and not lose all that money. You mentioned Ray Dalio, uh, the billionaire investor and hedge fund manager, said China treats its people like a strict parent. That's as far as he's willing to go. And so he just kind of uh, a strict abusive parent, <laughs> right? And Axios, which is the first place where I saw this story, Jim, uh, here's how they describe it. He says it says the WTA's announcement is a rare stance against the Chinese government. And then the bullet point sports leagues like the NBA have walked a tightrope with China in order to maintain a foothold in lucrative markets. What tightrope has the NBA walked here? All they've done is try to shut up anybody who criticizes China. The, the GM for the Houston Rockets now works for the Philadelphia 76ers. I mean, I guess there's that, but that's that's about it. That's, you know. <laughs> Ennis Cantor, and now Ennis Cantor Freedom still has a job. He's been very vocal about China. But in terms of the NBA itself, uh, according to him, they came to him at a recent uh, basketball game a few weeks ago now, uh, telling him that his job could be in trouble. He needs to stop talking about it. So then he asked him if there was anything um, the NBA could actually do to remove him, and it said no. So he's going to keep doing it. But uh, uh, it's not like the NBA is saying, we don't take a position on what he's saying, but we certainly celebrate his right to say it. No, they haven't said a word about that. So uh, keep that in mind as well. But, uh, Jim, another thing to keep in mind, which is also excellent, along with the news of the WTA's courage here, is the phenomenal products you can get from Omaha Steaks. Just last night, we had the Omaha Steaks burgers. I had two of them 
wonderful burgers. Lots of flavor, very juicy, uh, and absolutely as good of a burger as, as you're going to find. Uh, it's a little past grilling season here in Northern Virginia now that we're in December, so Mrs. Karum has cooked them indoors, but I've had them on the grill, uh, and they're phenomenal either way, and they're just part of a great, great package. The holidays are around the corner. Finding the perfect gift is tricky sometimes, but Omaha Steaks makes it easy. And right now, if you go to omahasteaks.com, enter Martini into the search bar, Order the perfect gift package. For $99.99, you'll get 24 entrees, like the world-famous bacon-wrapped filet mignon, chicken breast, sides, desserts, and so much more. And when you use the code MARTINI, you'll get an additional eight of those Omaha Steaks burgers free with your order. Look, there's reports out there about supply chain issues, shortages, shipping delays. Don't wait. Order the perfect gift package today at omahasteaks.com, and you'll get those eight free burgers when entering the code MARTINI. Achieve gifting greatness with Omaha Steaks. omahasteaks.com, keyword MARTINI. All right, Jim, on to our bad MARTINI now here. And this is, this is news we thoroughly expected. We just thoroughly expected it to happen sooner than this. So some people had started to wonder if it was going to happen. But no, Stacey Abrams has officially announced that she is running once again for governor of Georgia. She, of course, ran in 2018 against Brian Kemp. It was a pretty close race within a couple of points, but Kemp won by about 50,000 votes. Stacey Abrams never admitted that she lost. She simply alleged that, you know, if the election were fair, she would have been the next governor. But she acknowledged that she wouldn't be. She claimed that Kemp uh, unfairly removed people from the voting rolls when he was simply following the law. So this is going to be a huge high-profile race. Uh, she's a darling of the national liberal media, the Democratic Party, and so obviously they're going to be promoting her pretty hard. Brian Kemp is running for re-election. However, of course, Brian Kemp is the governor of Georgia who uh, you know was there when the 2020 presidential race was very, very tight, and ultimately uh, those uh, electoral votes went to Joe Biden. So Trump weighs in on this news yesterday and uh, shows just how – how much uproar there could be in this race. He says, Stacey the hoax Abrams has just announced that she's running for governor of Georgia. I beat her single-handedly without much of a candidate in 2018. I'll beat her again, but it will be hard to do with Brian Kemp because the MAGA base will just not vote for him after what he did with respect to election integrity and two horribly run elections for president and then two Senate seats. But some good Republican will run and some good Republican will get my endorsement and some good Republican will win. So... Jim, on the one hand, you've got Stacey Abrams, who has been claiming that she was the real winner in 2018. And we've been told when other people do that, that that's a major attack against democracy. Uh, at the same time, though, if Kemp is the nominee, uh, you could have Stacey Abrams with a significant advantage here if Trump tells his people to stay home. And then if Trump does run in 2024, he'll find a far more unfavorable governor there if Stacey Abrams wins next year. Greg, the first thing is I, the first bad sign is that she announced she's running for re-election. Yes, definitely. Uh, yeah, everybody made that joke yesterday. I think I was one of the first, but if you've heard it before, my apologies. But the so I suppose if you're a Democrat, this is something. This is technically good news for the Democrats. She's the highest profile candidate they could have, um, and that you know you want in a in a tough cycle where recruiting is going to be tough, and a lot of Democrats who might have been thinking about running are like, eh, I'm going to hold off. Um, this could end up being a, you know, this could galvanize Georgia Democrats. And it's not unthinkable that she could win, but I don't actually think it's likely. I think if you came close and not quite close enough in 2018, you're probably not going to do better in 2022. Stranger things have happened. You could argue that the Georgia Democratic Party is in better shape than a lot of Democratic parties in other uh, red to purple states. But I'm not convinced um this is something we necessarily have to worry about and i I do kind of wonder if she in a very interesting way she'll be a parallel to beta o'rourke um who you know came very close in 2018 and got a lot of national support and turned into a celebrity and then you know uh running it you know obviously o'rourke ran for president things didn't go well for him and he's running this time still getting a lot of money but i don't think beta o'rourke is going to be a you know particularly uh competitive candidate this time around 
Wow. Well, I certainly hope so. Yeah, Beto and Stacey Abrams and uh, Gillum in Florida were kind of the triumvirate of horrible midterm candidates, and thankfully none of them won. I think you're right about Georgia. If Kemp could win in a, uh, or whoever the Republican nominee is, but I think he's likely to be the nominee, uh, could win narrowly in uh, in a year that trended in favor of the Democrats and a year that looks to be trending in favor of the Republicans, uh, it should be a more comfortable margin. But uh, But we will see. Big Senate race is going to be on the ballot next year there, too. Looks like it's going to be Herschel Walker against uh, uh, Reverend Warnock. So uh, plenty to watch in Georgia coming into uh, 2022. All right, Jim, uh, in addition to uh, announcing what you're going to need for uh, running a successful campaign, especially statewide, lots of money. And that's not only true for candidates. Obviously, you want to maximize your investments as well. And right now, uh, with some of the uncertainty going on in the economy, investing in gold and silver could be the way to go. In fact, the price of silver has increased 340 percent since the year 2000 and continues trending higher. And if you want to get in on this trend, the best place you can go is Universal Coin and Bullion. Universal Coin and Bullion is offering our listeners a special locked-in price of just $30 for a beautiful one-ounce 2021 American Silver Eagle coin, the most popular coin in the world for collectors and investors. This limited offer is available at dealer's cost because Universal Coin wants you to own the first newly designed silver bullion coin since President Reagan signed the Gold Bullion Act in 1985. Call Universal Coin, the leaders in the precious metals industry, at 1-800-UCB-GOLD to get your beautiful U.S. Mint silver coin for just $30. Postage is free, and you can rest assured knowing you're dealing with the experts. Yeah, that expert is Dr. Mike Fulgens and his team at Universal Coin and Bullion. He's been called America's gold expert. He's the 2021 Coin Dealer of the Year. And once you get that coin in your hand, you're going to know you've got the real deal and you're dealing with people you can trust. But this special silver deal is only available using the code Martini when you call 800-UCB-GOLD. That's 800-UCB-GOLD. All right, Jim, let's move to our crazy martini now. And one of the things we talk about here a lot is look at the double standard between how the liberal media covers this story and a very similar story, but the political narratives are different. And so right now we've got two stories going on that uh, are involving courtrooms that the mainstream media is touching on, but not nearly to the extent you would expect if it was possible they could score some political points against the Republicans. One is Jesse Smollett. He's on trial, of course, for his alleged um, racial and homophobic uh, hoax attack that happened in the middle of the night, in the middle of a polar vortex on the south side of Chicago against a couple of uh, guys in MAGA hats. But that was uh, quickly exposed as uh, a hoax. And he's, of course, saying that the other guys in the hoax actually did attack him and, and that sort of thing. But his case seems to be falling apart. There's now uh, stories that there might have actually been a video of them doing a walkthrough of the uh, of the fake attack. And then, of course, the other one is uh, is Ghislaine Maxwell. Ghislaine Maxwell, however you say that, the uh, former uh, madam, basically, for Jeffrey Epstein. She's on trial for uh, sex trafficking. Some of these victims have started to take the stand. You've got uh, people of all political persuasions, essentially, in uh, Jeffrey Epstein's uh, little black book. Uh, more people have been exposed for having flown on his plane, assuming to the island. And so it would appear that uh, some people uh, don't want that information to be widely disseminated, Jim. So uh, what do you make of how the media is treating these two cases? First of all, regarding the the Maxwell trial, I'll, I'll be honest, I haven't, I haven't followed the coverage, but you're right, I noticed I haven't seen a lot of the coverage. It may also be that I'm not interested in it in the sense that, not that I don't want to see people held accountable, but I just want everybody involved to be set on fire. Um, and so it, it's one of those things where like, I, I assume we're getting a guilty verdict in this, maybe we're not, um, but it's one of those things where this has always stunk to high heaven all the way um, uh, down to the, the suicide of Epstein, uh, the possibility that lots and lots of powerful people, uh, including former presidents, perhaps of both parties, and you know high-level corporate executives and all kinds of stuff were involved in an ongoing underage prostitution ring is just absolutely horrifying. It's the sort of thing that makes, uh, uh, I think, fu- you know, fuels a lot of those QAnon conspiracy theories, and you see stuff like that. Uh, you may think, well, you know, the idea of it, there are no evil, you know, conspiracies of celebrities, you know, enslaving underage people. It's just Jeffrey Epstein and R. Kelly. And God knows who else. Um, but the Jesse Smollett one, I think I, I wrote about this a bit earlier this week. One, you're right. I don't think you're seeing 
nearly as much coverage of this trial as the original uh, uh you know report claims from smollett and i think that there should be a bit more he's not you know first of all it sounds like based on how the trial is going there's a good chance he will be found guilty these are not severe punishments for i believe his uh the, the charges that he's facing but i believe it's important for accountability jesse smollett tried to tell the world that uh not only was he attacked <laughs> he was attacked by maga make, make america great again hat wearing racists who put a noose around his neck and covered throat through bleach and all that stuff oh by the way this all allegedly happened on one of the coldest nights in chicago in many many years um but they did it because they recognized him from empire greg <laughs> now the odd thing is i just don't think the the maga hat wearing racist presumably a redneck you know, these, I just don't think they're big viewers of Empire. I, the idea that, you know, not just like, oh, maybe they recognize Taraj Henson or um, the guy who played Rhodey in the first Iron Man movie. Um, like, those are the big stars. The idea that they're sitting around saying, hey, look, it's Jesse Smollett. Let's get him. <laughs> that really strains my, quick, we're, here we are out at 2 a.m. on the coldest night in Chicago in years. Let's get, we've got a noose, we've got bleach, we've brought all this stuff together. This is exactly the opportunity we wanted, you know. Um, and the irony is that, like, from day one, people in Chicago said, this doesn't make sense. This doesn't, you know, like, people who were out in, you know, who knew how cold it was that night were just like, huh? Uh, but a lot of celebrities, a lot of political figures, including Kamala Harris and including Joe Biden, bought the story hook, line, and sinker. Or maybe I should point out, whoever runs their social media accounts like Twitter utterly believed this and offered statements saying, I can't believe this would happen in America. When, in fact, it really should have been, Actually, Jesse Smollett, I cannot believe this would happen in America. We have racists in this country. We have terrible people in this country. But generally, they don't you know, rampage through the streets of Chicago on the coldest night of the year. Um, by and large, people are circumspect about their uh, hateful and racist attitudes. They know there are consequences. So, And so he basically, Jesse Smollett offered this vision of what the country is, a false vision of what the country is. And a lot of Democrats decided, said, yeah, yeah, this is terrible. This happens all the time. No, it doesn't happen all the time. So one, it is important to you know, kind of acknowledge that that was not true. And the second thing is the reason Jesse Smollett is in a courtroom now, nearly three years later, is because the original prosecutor in this case, Kim Fox, or I guess she came over to her assistant, basically what seems like one of the most blatant cases of prosecutorial misconduct gave him like even beyond a sweetheart deal. This was a love affair of the century kind of deal in which you got 100 hours of community service and we're going to forget this ever happened i think what happened was that jesse smollett's lie was so absurd and so implausible and so easily contradicted by the you know proven facts um that it basically turned into a giant embarrassment for all of his usual allies and they just wanted this the story to go away so the answer was okay let's just give him community service and hope everybody forgets about it but i think there are a lot of people who are genuinely angry about that and you didn't have to be a Republican. You didn't have to be a Trump supporter. You, 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 know, you just had to be somebody who said, no, this is a ridiculous hoax. And you're trying to tell people that America is more racist than it actually is. And that's bad. That's harmful. That's something we should discourage in this world. And if you do it and you file a false police report, there should be consequences. And now, hopefully, there will be consequences, Greg, although I guess we have to wait a few more days to, to get the verdict. Yeah, you never know what the uh, what the verdict's going to be in these cases. But you're exactly right. It's very dangerous uh, to you know perpetuate the narrative that uh, there's all this division, all this hate, all this violence just lurking around the next corner. Hopefully, justice is served here, and hopefully, the message goes out that uh, there are severe consequences for making up this sort of stuff. But our day here is done. Jim, have a good Thursday. I'll see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity, National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Thanks very much for being with us today. Please subscribe to the podcast. Tell your friends about us as well. Also, thank you so much for your five-star ratings and your kind reviews. Get us on your home devices. All you have to say is play 3 Martini Lunch podcast. Follow us on Twitter. He's at Jim Garrity. I'm at Dateline underscore DC. Have a great Thursday, and please join us again on Friday for the next 3 Martini Lunch. Hi, this is Greg Corumbus, and I'm here with Dr. Mike Fulgens. He's the president of Universal Coin and Bullion. Mike was recently named the 2021 Dealer of the Year by the American Numismatic Association. Mike, once your genuine gold and silver is delivered securely to my doorstep, what is the best way to safely store it? And how can I go about selling it once I'm ready to do so? Well, I recommend storing your gold and silver 
at a safety deposit box, except maybe keeping a little bit in a safe at home. And do not put the safe in your master bedroom or bathroom. That's the first place in a break-in that the bad guys go. And I would say that uh, I would in, uh, encourage people to ask for our free gold guide, which has been voted the best in the industry, which has an interview with law enforcement on things to do to reduce the chance of theft in the future. Dr. Mike Fulgens is recognized as America's gold expert by the U.S. government. Contact Mike and his team of professionals at Universal Coin and Bullion to own your gold and silver coins now. Call 1-800-UCB-GOLD.